Welcome to this edition of Diligence Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm TK Kerstetter, and I'll be your host for today's show. Today, we have a very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about understanding next-gen board members, mid-career, and family challenges when they serve on the board. And joining me, somebody that sort of fits into that uh, situation, is Andrea Varnado, who is a board, mem board member with Umqua Holding Corporation and Red Robin Gourmet Burgers. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And it's a really important and relevant topic, especially coming out of the last two years and understanding where society is moving. So thank you for having me to discuss this. I do want to say that we have the chance to serve together on the Diligence to Advisory Board, which I enjoy. Um, and also you're part of the Next Gen Board Leaders community um, that uh, is a group of directors in their 30s and 40s who sort of um, take a look and share what may be uh, ways that they can fit into the boardroom and be more effective. So it's a pleasure to have you. So it's a fact that uh, board members are getting younger and younger, okay? And I think that this sort of trend started when people wanted to have sort of uh, a skill set that understood digital uh, transformation and were digitally savvy. And then I think a lot of boards discovered that, hey, this um, particular generation has a lot to offer with respect to, you know, where our business is going and what's happened. And I think that uh, it's be, it's it's not quite the aberration that it was in the beginning and now we're seeing more and more board members and the interesting thing is um you can join a board and find that you'll have a situation where you're 20 to 25 years younger than any other of your fellow board members that sit on the board again we said that's changing a little bit but there's still plenty of situations where that's the case so that creates interesting challenges of board leadership and the management of the company, understanding that the mid-career mid and family situation. So if you could, Andrea, just take a second to talk about some of those challenges that a younger next-gen board member finds when they commit to serve on a public board. Well, thank you for bringing up the topic. And um, in many ways, to your point around uh, the growing number, but still a nascent number of what you consider younger mid-career um, board directors, it happens both internally and externally. Internally, there is, from a board perspective of being the only or the token, we've seen this happen in race, we've seen it happen in gender, and now we're seeing it happen in age and not to accommodate certain groups, but really to understand um, the value and the perspective that these board directors bring while also helping to manage for this next generation. And so to your point around some of the challenges that um, a mid-career board member or board director might face, they, if they're in their 30s and 40s, especially as we look at society and um, people having children later in life versus early 20s, now it's happened in mid 30s, some early 40s, especially with science and technology, you'll find that a lot of board directors have younger children that they need to accommodate for. They have possibly spouses and they might even have aging parents. But in addition to that, you mentioned the keyword mid-career, which means they're also full-time operators. And so in addition to thinking about the external um, areas that they have affecting their lives around children and family, they also have a full-time job that they are looking to manage and they're hoping to work with the board on. And the way that I see this TK is while we're focusing on mid-career professionals, because I think this is a really important topic, a lot of times what you find is that it's hard for someone to empathize if they aren't in that position or they haven't been in that position in a while. And so it's in many ways similar to anyone that might be faced with um, an aging parent or a sick child or even a board director having their own terminal illness. It becomes how do you better accommodate 
the life aspects that your board directors are facing overall. And I think as a, as a society for corporate America, we've been really great about accommodating certain medical and family leave um, circumstances, but specifically we haven't looked at board directors that are in this age group and the challenges that they're facing. That just provides for more opportunity for evolution when it comes to some of the challenges that these groups are facing. Yeah, well, and 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 that age group, it someone could even be having a child, okay, not already having a child, but and I can pretty well guarantee you when I served on a public board, there was no policy, pregnancy policy for board members. Okay. There's no maternity leave. I have yet to see one. And TK, I am one of those board directors that um in the midst of serving on two boards became pregnant and had a child during this time and had to navigate, fortunately, with the support of two amazing boards, but did have to navigate and decide how to communicate and how to arrange uh, my time away or even my participation in lieu of a formal policy. And that's one of the, I mean, that's the main reason we're doing this show is to bring some sensitivity to understand some of the challenges for a next-gen director on the board, but yeah, you would be a perfect example of that um, uh, with the example you just gave. So one of the things you didn't mention was a board compensation. And again, this would not surface, I don't think very high on someone's thought process, even when they think of thirties and forties, but sometimes I've heard when there's stock awards and there's taxes to be paid, sometimes, that can be a little daunting uh, for people, particularly when after that event, the stock goes down <laughs> and um, you're left, you know, sort of holding something that's not quite as valuable as it was when it was um, awarded. So um, I would guess that in some ways um, uh, that can be a problem. Have you heard that from your peers at all? I have, and uh, while I do think it probably affects the mid-career professionals more, believe it or not, I've heard it from all of the board directors, but the challenge um, I think that you're highlighting is, especially if you're newer to a board and mid-career, what you're highlighting is you have to pay taxes on these vested stock um, grants that you've been given. However, most companies have kind of these stock withholding or stock holding requirements that are anywhere from three to five years. And so you're paying taxes on something that you likely have not been able to sell because you might not have been on the board as long, where other board directors who have that tenure or that length are able to sell because they've been outside of those holding requirements. The separate piece of it is, and while this isn't true for all board directors, um, if you have someone who is more senior on the board who's who has probably significantly more wealth just because they've been working a longer period of time, they might not uh, be as aware or as considerate of the fact that there's someone that might not have just as much. And so um, we've certainly heard it, and I'd say especially in these last two years, to your point, when you've seen stock prices really fluctuate, um, it's been a challenge around how do you plan for that compensation? And in many cases, how do you at least make board directors aware of the situation so that they can plan into it before it happens? And I think what we're highlighting here, TK, is when you join a board, there's so many nuanced pieces of information. You don't know what you don't know, and you don't experience until you've experienced it. And a lot of these issues come up as they're happening. So you're solving it as they're happening. And so some of this is just around how do we better communicate? How do we help board directors plan? How do we work in lieu of the policies that have been put in place that were likely more geared towards more senior members of the board? So um, that's a good segue into um, a two-part final question for you. First of all, what kinds, what would you recommend that companies and board leadership sort of discuss relative to these certain life and career situations? Um, and then what is the responsibility of the next gen uh, individual as far as communicating on the front end that these are some of the challenges that I have? Talk a little bit about sort of both those responsibilities. So I'll, I'll take this in a three part. Um, as you said that I was writing down notes because I do think that there are some solutions that are right in front of us, quick wins and long term plans. Um, so first and foremost, I think that while we have these life challenges, it's really on both the board overall, as well as the director, him or herself, um, 
to communicate and to make sure some of these things. And so one of the things that I think about, uh, you and I had mentioned separately, that there was a time where some boards, if they're going through a critical point of transition, they can take a lot of your time. And I think um, in this day and age, while people are joining boards and we're seeing more diversity and we're seeing a lot more participation, at the same time, we aren't always clear up front as to what could happen and what could be expected. And so one of the first things that I would mention is if you're joining a board or participating and you're full mid-career and so you're a full-time operator, make sure you have the support of your CEO or, or of your organization. That was probably the best piece of advice I received early on in my board journey. Because as things come up, as um, your board needs more of your attention that might be unexpected, you're taking vacation days, you're taking days out of the office, you're traveling on the weekends, you are splitting your focus and that's okay because we can do it efficiently. But it's even better if you have the support of your company and your CEO so that they understand where else you might be participating and they can help to craft your own schedule. And so I think that's on the board director to do so. The second piece of it is, when we talk about the stock compensation piece or any other areas is how are you doing your onboarding? Typically when I've seen board onboarding, it's been more specifically about getting to know the management team and getting to know the committees, but it has been less about here's the structure, here's how we operate, here's some things that you might consider in the totality of your board participation and package, and even talking about that compensation and tax withdrawal piece, just some of those things that come up informally having that as a formal onboarding process and discussion is helpful, especially for anyone that's deciding, is it time for me to join a board? Maybe not, or maybe so. And then the final piece I think is really more on the board overall. Um, the tech companies have been really great about moving forward with life instances, especially in tech companies. We've seen increase both maternity and paternal leave. And I think this is something that boards should think about, whether it's a formal policy or not, even acknowledging that Someone might have a child, someone might have an aging parent, someone might have a sick child, and I mean sick as an older, or a sick spouse. How do you accommodate for these life instances? One of the things I think we've learned in this pandemic is that hybrid does work. Maybe you don't need to be in person as often. And trust me, I'm the person, I love being in person with my board and with my team, but I think we've acknowledged that people can be really efficient and so maybe you can have more hybrid meetings. And then the final piece, and this is personal, but I think it's important that we share is it's not just maternity leave. When I think about um, moms who are traveling and who are going to board meetings, if you're thinking about breastfeeding or pumping or any other things you might need, how do you build in those breaks into meetings to be able to accommodate that or have a hybrid option so that others can completely participate in the board experience or not without having to miss anything or having it deemed against the board against full participation. So those are just three things that I think we can do. CEO support, onboarding, um, and then planning for just life happenings. Andrea, it's just great oversight, great advice to you know, companies that I'm sure have not had these discussions as much as they should have. And it's not gonna get any less prevalent, it's only gonna get more. And uh, I hope that people you know, uh, can learn from this um, video uh, about some of the discussions and some of the thoughts that should be going on in the boardroom, particularly as you're searching for younger and younger directors. So I wanna thank you for taking the time not only to join us, but to offer such great advice. TK, I appreciate sharing it. And I will say that we are all evolving and learning together. And so I expect that we will learn more in the next few years. And I look forward to hearing more from your own podcast and other members of our next gen group. Okay, well, thank you again. So that will conclude this edition of Diligence Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at a critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then.